Hello, Damian Erskine here. Um, today I wanted to talk a little bit about walking bass lines. Um, I know a lot of a lot of people just getting into jazz, a lot of bass players just starting to explore this stuff. Um, I've come across a lot of students who get a little bit freaked out by the idea of walking bass lines and uh, just kind of avoid it altogether. <laughs> um, and uh, there's really no need to uh, avoid it or be scared of it. It's really, um, as with a lot of things, it's a very simple concept um, that just, you know, can take a while to master, um, get to the point where you're playing comfortably, confidently, smoothly, um, really laying it down. Um, but really, there's just a, a, a couple key things you need to know. Um, and of course, the more broader um, and more vast your musical explorations and uh, the more stuff you listen to the more informed you will be as you develop um, your lines no matter what you're playing um, so if nothing else it's worth exploring um, a lot of the things that I learned through working on walking bass lines um, were some of the things that really helped me when I got into soloing or coming up with licks or you know even when I'm playing a um, uh, playing a funk gig um, it is informed by the things I learned working on jazz walking bass lines so um, let's get into it uh, a couple of things I want to mention before we, we uh, play any notes um, your, your key functions are that of timekeeper and harmony outliner. <laughs> you are there to essentially play, play the bottom of the chords, uh, the harmonic motion, um, kind of laying it all out so that everything everybody does on top um, is rooted in what you are doing down on the bottom. And then it is very important that you, that you have a solid pulse and good tone and feel. Um, I, I like when I'm playing a jazz gig I like to set up um, on the ride side of the drummer so if it's a typical right-handed drummer setup I'll be to his right which is the opposite a lot of us especially on pop funk all that we like to be hi-hat side um, so we can really just be there get into it with him and lock into his kick and snare but when I'm playing jazz and playing swing um, I I want to I want to zero in on his ride cymbal I want to time my notes with the tip of his stick hitting the ride cymbal. Um, so even if I'm reading a chart, I'm keeping his stick or her stick um, in my peripheral vision and really trying to just be one with the ride cymbal, uh, with the pulse of the ride cymbal. So that's the first thing. Um, second thing, a lot of my, uh, a lot of, I see a lot of young students coming in and even if they have a pretty great idea of what they're doing and they can walk pretty well they come in with the tone that they like to use for everything else um, um, that kind of bridge pickup um, punchy uh, you know it's not really the Jocko tone because that's not actually what he sounded like but a lot of people call it that um, is not necessarily what you want for when you're walking bass. Um, you don't want it to be really thin, really brittle, really punchy. Um, especially, you know, when you're playing an electric bass on a swing gig, um, we have to be a little sensitive to the fact that traditionally it's it's been a job relegated to upright bass players. Now, a lot of, a lot of players do a phenomenal job on electric, but I've heard over and over again from a lot of the older jazz musicians I play with that the first thing they had to learn to get past was the fact that they could actually hear everything the bass player was doing. They could really, everything you play is so much more present on an electric bass than it is on an upright. I'm not going to say it should or shouldn't be done anyway. That's that's not my, my style. I think anything, it's all up for grabs. Um, but you need to be sensitive to the style of the music and the, uh, the aesthetic oral aesthetic of the music. Um, so I tend to strongly, if not entirely, favor um, my neck pickup. And I will either tend to walk uh, slightly muted, actually trying to hear the sound of an upright in my head, maybe even a tuba. Um,
playing with a thumb, a little bit of a palm mute going, or just playing closer to the, to the fretboard. Get away from the bridge. Even with that front pickup, there's just a little bit too much of a point on the, each note to me. It might get a little too tubby up here. So I might, I might play, you know, right over the front pickup, maybe a little closer to the fretboard. Um, like so. Uh, another thing, um, if you're going to play, sh be aware of your note duration, basically. Um, I like the palm muting thing because there's a little bit of a natural decay to every note. You know, we kind of get the note, but then it decays naturally. Um, what I don't want to, what I don't want to hear from a bass player, um, even if they have a good tone, is, is these really kind of semi-staccato um, notes. If I'm playing op kind of open and just, you know, just plucking normally, I generally want the notes to kind of butt up against each other. Um, don't cut the notes short if you can help it um, unless you know if you're going for something and that's what you hear you know go for it um, but a lot of times some a lot of those things are more just unconscious habits that people have because they're they're coming to something new and bringing all of their old stylistic tendencies with them um, so we're going to need to be aware of and at least open to the possibility of new stylistic tendencies um, one more pet peeve, which is something I, I tend to want to do naturally, and I hear a lot of bass players do it, and it never really bothered me. But um, when I've done gigs with really seasoned actual jazz drummers, I don't consider myself a jazz bassist. I'm a bassist, plays a million different things, and works on jazz. But when I try, when I do a jazz gig, I try and sound like a jazz bassist to the best of my abilities. Um, I have a long way to go. Full disclosure. <laughs> um, the thing that I hear uh, from a lot of uh, uh, you know older, more seasoned veteran jazz musicians, um, uh, when there's an electric player on the gig, they don't like us uh, using the upright affectations. You know, there's a, there's a little bit of a tendency to do uh, the burps. really it takes up um, it's a natural tendency of mine that was kind of an exaggerated extreme version of it I never did it like that but natural tendency of mine as well um, it really to me it always just helped me to feel the swing um, but I've been told that it can really clutter and I've become sensitive to it since and now I hear it when I hear other people do it it really clutters the rhythmic and sonic space it takes up a lot of unnecessary space um, in large part due to the fact that the electric bass is more present than um, the upright bass ever was. And a lot of those things were um, came about naturally as a result of navigating that much larger, much more difficult physically to play instrument. Um, it was just kind of how you, how you got from here to there often on that instrument. And it's not necessary for us and um, yeah, it gets in the way. Long story short. So, with all of those things in mind, um, time, tone, feel. Now, what do you play when you look at a set of chord changes? I'm going to bring a tune up here from my iReal Pro app, uh, world's greatest practice tool when you're working, especially when you're working on this kind of stuff. Um, and what I want to talk to you folks about is um, the idea of setting up targets. Um, whether I'm walking or soloing or no matter what it is, when I'm improvising through changes, um, a large part of what's going through my mind is um, I'm looking ahead at the chords coming up and kind of comparing and contrasting that to where I am currently and I'm thinking about where I want to go. I'm setting little target notes for myself. If I'm on bar one um, of this tune, you'll see I have Lady Bird up. If I'm on that C major seven, I'm probably already looking to that F minor seven, thinking, hmm, should I just go, you know, outline the roots? Um, maybe I'll 
go, you know, and I'll look at the F minor 7 to B flat 7, and I'll, I'll make a decision like, ah, I could play the third of F minor 7, which is A flat, which is a whole step away from the B flat. So maybe I can just wind up on the third and then do a little slippery chromatic lead into the B flat. And then so I'm kind of doing that as I cycle through the tune, constantly looking ahead, looking at what's around it, and trying to come up with little ideas ahead of time. They might be larger concepts, or it might just be like, I want to land on the third of that chord. Boom, there it is. <clears throat> um, so, two things to keep in mind. Many of you are familiar with these concepts already. Um, there's two types of approach notes. And when I say approach notes, I mean the notes we're using to approach those targets. Um, there are scalar approach notes, and there are chromatic approach notes. So if I want to walk up from a C major to an F, I can use my scalar approach notes and literally just use the notes that are in the scale of C major until I get to that F minor. And then I would be using the notes appropriate for F minor um, to, use, to come up with a scalar approach to a note in B flat 7. Um, so scalar approach. beats per bar so if I'm playing one bar of C I can't just go right to the F because I'm early and I'm not using chromaticisms yet so I just skipped over the my my target note and use the next scalar note up one two three five four scalar notes can come from above to below below to above circle around and land on that target um, likewise chromaticism um, can approach from below, above, both, below then above, above then below, multiple chromaticisms from above or and or below. Um, it can kind of come from any which way. Um, then it becomes a matter of, of uh, you know, resolution and making sure that you're still outlining the harmony and not getting a little, not getting too vague. Um, another thing to keep in mind. Um, I'm a firm believer in music, in art, any art form, um, and especially in jazz, where it's uh, the whole kind of purpose in jazz is to uh, be creative in the moment, and you know the ideal is to create something that's never been, never happened before, right? So, um, in the spirit of that, uh, pay close attention to every rule that I give you, and then explore how to successfully break all of them. Um, all, of, all of the rules you will hear teachers talk about are really just general guidelines. And once you get to a certain place in your development, you quickly be, uh, begin to realize that you can abandon almost all of those rules. Um, but you can only do it successfully once you understand the rules. So you can't just ignore them altogether. Um, the, the guidelines have come about um, for good reasons. So, um, you know, learn, learn your scales, learn your rules, and then forget them, ideally. Um, but you can only do that successfully once you've internalized them um, conceptually, physically. Bleh, there it is. Um, so, I'm going to play along to this at a, at a moderate tempo. This tune is usually a little faster. Maybe I'll do it faster later. And I'm going to try and um, demonstrate a few things that I've talked about. So in order for you to successfully um, navigate these changes, um, you will previously have had to kind of figure out what these changes mean. <laughs> um, you've seen a lot of my other articles and videos about arpeggios, endless arpeggios, up and down um, modes, scales, and chord changes. And this is why. Because um, when you're setting those targets, uh, you know, eight times out of ten, it's, you're going to be targeting a chord tone. So you need to know what all the chord tones are before you can successfully explore and utilize them. So you need to know um, the chord tones and eventually upper structure extensions. So one, three, five, seven are your primary chord tones, and then nine, eleven, thirteen, or two, four, six of the scale um, are your 
extensions or upper structure triads or whatever you want to call them. So you want to know that major, just like the major scale, one, three, five, seven. Um, dominant chords have a flat seven, and that dominant chord looks like this B flat seven right here. Um, no symbol, just a a note and a seven. Uh, minor flat three flat seven minor seven flat five just like it says um, you'll want to have gone through all of that if you're not sure about what any of that means that I just said um, maybe go back to a previous video or a previous article I've uh, I have written about it any number of times here at No Trouble um, I've also got videos on my own YouTube page talking about that stuff um, most everybody who does videos and articles here at No Trouble has tackled some of that stuff plus there's just no end to the amount of explanations on YouTube and the rest of the internet about that stuff. So, enough talking. Um, let's get to some walking bass lines. First, 100 BPM. And I might stop here and there. Um, I'm going to try and talk while I do things. I generally start to screw up as soon as I do that. So. We'll just take it as it is. So first, I'm going to do nothing but scalar approach notes. Now this is about as inside as it gets. Ultimately, it's it's a very bland vanilla way to do it, but um, but you are you'll be successfully doing your job. I'll let you know when I'm going to target um, other notes. Maybe I'll start by thinking I'm just going to outline that C major scale for the first two bars. Um, don't forget. I have a lot of students who only, you know, they'll start walking and every four beats they change chords regardless of what the chart says. Make sure you count the appropriate number of beats per bar. Um, so two bars of C major, then to F minor 7 to B flat 7 back to C major. So I'm going to set the target note of um, an A flat on that F minor 7 walking back to the root of B flat 7 using scalar approach notes first throughout. And beyond that, we'll just see what happens. fine I tried to develop uh, tried to pay attention to the opportunity to use motifs um, which is a very handy tool if you play a melodic shape de, 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 it can be nice to repeat that general melodic shape while outlining the new chord the new harmony and the further you can extend that sometimes it can be a really a really hip device Okay, so now let's do the same thing with some chromaticism um, thrown in to the mix. Aside from me trying to talk um, and think of concepts and hitting wrong notes, <laughs> um, you might have noticed on bar three I hit the A flat again on that F minor seven, but instead of having to jump around through the scale to use scalar approach notes, I just simply use chromaticisms. Um, chromaticisms can really help, especially if you have, you know, you have three beats to get somewhere 
um, and you only have two scale notes in between where you are and where you want to be, um, you can use chromaticism to, to kind of fill the space a little bit. Um, it also is a very strong, uh, has a very strong pull, especially when you use notes that are outside of the harmony to chromatically resolve to something. It helps to pull the ear into that note a little bit. Um, so walking bass lines are a great way to practice chromaticism, which is also helpful when soloing, when doing anything, just being able to use all of the notes, no matter what you're playing over. Um, walking bass lines are a nice, a nice, uh, simple enough way to conceive, a uh, way to work through that stuff, if that made sense. Um, also, the last two bars, if you look at your PDF, you might have noticed that you didn't hear me go or something like that, outlining all the roots. There I very much use chromaticism to walk through the changes. I'm playing, essentially putting a line straight through the changes. So C, chromatic approach note to the 5 V flat, which is B flat, chromatic approach note to that A flat, and then I don't remember if I... I don't remember exactly what I did through. I think I went to the root, and then maybe to the third of C major. Um, so chromatic approach, chromatic approach, five, one, three, three of the one. You have to be careful using inversions and other chord tones other than the root um, too often, because um, again, you don't want to make the, the changes ambiguous. Um, a C major 7 with that C and the bass um, sounds much different if you throw the 3rd in the bass or the 5th in the bass. Um, they all work, they all sound cool, but it, it changes the dynamic a little bit. Um, and you have to remember that a lot of piano players and guitar players, the comping instruments, um, aren't, bother, aren't bothering with the roots because they expect that the bass player is already playing them. So a lot of the times they're playing rootless voicings for these changes. And if you start playing nothing but thirds and fifths um, in, on the big, the big downbeats, um, it kind of makes it sound like everybody there's different changes happening which can sometimes be cool it's just something you need to be aware of and learn to control and hear um, and you know make judicious use of the technique um, so it's a very in a nutshell I know this was more talking than playing and I apologize but I wanted to get across the concepts um, to you guys and give you the tools to really work on it slowly but successfully. And I will give you um, one exercise which I think I've written about but I'm going to show it to you here. But so remember to recap. Um, time, tone, feel. Watch that ride cymbal. Lock up with the drummer if you're playing with a drummer. Um, and you know, just like in funk, you, you want to lock with the kick and a snare. In jazz, you want to lock with the ride cymbal. Uh, you know, generally speaking, um, be aware of your tone, where you're plucking, how hard you're plucking, what pickup you're using. Make sure your you make sure your tone sounds right for the music. Um, and also make sure you're you're not too loud. <laughs> um, so let me give you one. Um, oh, and uh, beep, 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 zzz, and don't forget to practice scalar approaches, just simply using the available scale notes to navigate the changes, and then start adding chromaticism. Um, don't be afraid to just start super simply. If you're happy, if you feel like it's too many notes to think about, it's too much, um, you can practice playing in what's called a two feel which is instead of quarter notes, we play half notes. So in a bar of 4-4, four, four, there's two notes per bar. And often when playing in a two feel, you're basically playing root five, just the root and the fifth of each chord. So you can practice just playing
to get more comfortable and expand from there. Um, also, as a, as a practice tool, you can just practice playing root third through every chord to make sure you can identify the thirds. Root fifth, root seventh, try just playing the third and the seventh. You know, um, there's a lot of ways you can work through changes to get yourself more comfortable with um, the immediate fit, the immediate identification of the chord tones, uh, which is kind of a prerequisite to a good walking bass line, um, especially if it's not like you, the style of music you listen to all the time. If you're not like a, a, a tried and true um, jazz lifer, and maybe the sound is not as ingrained in your ears and in your in your guts as something else <clears throat> it's a good way to start building that familiarity um, both with the instrument and um, with your ears um, so now boop, let me give you one uh, pretty pretty difficult um, easy conceptually difficult in actuality um, exercise that uh, by no means is a is a formula for a great walking bass line, but it will force you to have to see um, see your way through changes and think about them in a way you may not have done before. So, what I do with this exercise, I just call it um, walking a scale through changes. And that's literally what we do. When we play a scale, we're just playing a tonality in seconds in steps, whole steps and half steps. Um, and we're going to do the same thing but through chord changes. So I like to start with my lowest available note um, for the first chord. Our first chord is a C major. I'm playing a four string bass right now. So my lowest available note is an E. It's the third of the chord. And then I usually pick a spot up high. Um, whatever your highest string on the 12th fret is a good place to go good place to start. Um, you can do the whole fretboard, you can do whatever you want. And the thing we're going to do is walk through the changes playing only half and whole steps. Now this can this can be pretty tricky if, if you haven't spent a lot of time thinking your way through chord changes where maybe the tonality is shifting every few bars or every few beats depending on the song. Um, so we'll use this song for now. Um, it's not too many changes. Uh, ultimately, it's good to flip through different songs, pick songs with more changes, maybe two changes per bar, different types of changes to get you thinking in different ways. And and at four, you know, at four beats, uh, at four notes per bar, feels like too much. You can slow the song way down. You know, we could take this at 50 BPM. It doesn't have to be 100. Or, again, you could take the two-feel approach and just play half notes. Um, and again, the real key is that um, we're only playing half steps and whole steps. So it's not going to be a great walking bass line because they're going to wind up landing on uh, any given scale tone and for any, any given chord. Um, but it's going to force us to play long arcs up and down through the chord changes. Um, which is which is useful gets you thinking about things you know you find yourself landing having to pick the the uh, the sixth or the flat sixth of a minor seven flat five and you realize I don't even know which one I'm supposed to use so then you either google it and figure out you know why people use one or the other or you use your ears and decide which one sounds better to you um, I think that's a, a healthier approach I don't care what the jazz book says I want to figure out what sounds best to my ears um, and I, I encourage, but I encourage you to explore both things. Figure out what sounds good to you, and then read up and see what um, the jazz gods say, um, the jazz police. See what they say it should be, and you know, uh, get to know their reasoning for it as well. And maybe your ears will evolve to prefer that over what you do now. But if you like the way this sounds? Use it. So okay, so much talking. So let me uh, let me do a two feel first starting on an E. And I'll call out the notes as I play them. Hopefully I don't mess myself up. Let's see if I can actually do this without screwing up.
So um, one thing that I realized as I was doing that, I was like, ah, I, did, I didn't set any parameters for myself, so I guess I'll just stick to straight major scale for the major chord. Um, I did play a natural six on one of the minor chords, uh, which makes it Dorian. Um, kind of out of habit. Um, often I'll predetermine. I'll say on the major chords I'm going to play a sharp 11. Minor chords I'll play, treat as Dorian. Um, natural 9 on the minor 7 flat 5. I'll kind of come up with my preferred chord scale um, for the exercise. Which can be, you know, can be nice to switch it up and do it different ways too. Let's see if I can, I'm not going to talk this time. Let's see if I can play it um, quarter notes. I haven't done this exercise in a long time, but I was reminded of it. And uh, let's see if I can do it. You get the idea, just going up and down. I need to revisit that exercise as well. Every time I do a video, I realize there's something something I used to be able to do that I can't do as easily. Um, and again, uh, switch up the songs. Pick an easy tune, do a two feel, get comfortable with it, try some quarter notes, maybe slow it down, speed it up, and then switch, switch through. When I was really doing this a lot and working with jazz changes a lot more than I do these days, um, I mean, I could, I could do this and all my chordal exercises through Countdown, you know, all the Coltrane tunes and Wayne Shorter tunes. I used to just throw all the hardest stuff at myself, and I was, I was pretty good at one point at doing this stuff. Um, it's, it's kind of a use it or lose it school, skill, um, and it really opens up your perception of harmony on your fretboard. And it really gets you just seeing where everything is. Um, take it slow. Don't do it faster than you can do it well. Um, but then don't forget to just bump it up and push yourself. Don't get too comfortable. You want to be challenged, but not practicing wrong material, as I say often. So, I hope that helps some of you uh, bass players out there who have been um, dabbling with the jazz thing and thinking about walking bass lines and just not really knowing how to go about it. Um, it's not rocket science. It's just tone, time, feel. Um, it's really more a matter of be, being familiar enough with chord symbols to interpret them in real time. That's the key, and that's why exercises like this are good, because they force you to play in time um, and play play through the music. And you know, and if you if you're hitting some wrong notes, you know, figure out what they are and, and try and analyze why you're messing up. Are you just spacing out? Are you not sure what the nine is on a half diminished chord? So okay, I got to figure it out. Um, evaluate why the mistakes happen and then take control over that aspect of, the, of your playing. Um, so, thanks again for checking these out. Um, keep the questions coming, uh, no trouble. Uh, check out the other videos if you have any questions. There's a search bar up in the corner. You can just type in some keywords and a million and one articles will pop up from me and others on the site. Um, so, right on. Take it easy.